everyone, it's Night Messenger, back with another horrific true crime case. This is the horrific and tragic murder of Cassie Jo Stoddard, a young driven teen who had great ambitions for her future until her life was tragically stolen away. Hey look, it's Cassie. Hey look, I don't know. Hello Cassie. <laughs> I'm getting you on tape, okay? Say hi, please. Hi. Okay, see ya. We're writing our plan right now for tonight. It's gonna be cool. We can get our first kill done, start it, and we can keep going. Killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat, and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. I so Shut fast. Shut the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. It's okay. Okay, well, well, let's buy movie tickets now. I'm going down in history. We're gonna be just like Scream, except real life terms. That We're gonna be murders. Good, baby. Like, let's see, Ted Bundy. Cassie Joe Stoddard was a junior in high school and attended Pocatello High School and had the whole world ahead of her. Friends and family knew Cassie as a responsible person who was friends with everyone. She was a hard worker with straight A's and had big dreams after high school. However, her ambitions were cut short on September 22nd, 2006. On the evening of September 22nd, Cassie was house sitting for her aunt and uncle just a few miles away from her home in Pocatello, Idaho. Her family was out of town and asked if she could take care of their three cats and two dogs for the weekend, which Cassie happily agreed to. Although, Cassie didn't want to spend the entire weekend alone, and invited her boyfriend, Matt Beckham, over. At around 6 p.m., Matt arrived, but he also wanted to invite a couple of friends over. Then later that evening, Cassie's classmates, Brian Draper and Tori Adamick, came over to hang out. Cassie was having a great time, and gave the friends a tour of the house, including the basement. Afterwards, the four went up to the living room to watch Kill Bill Volume 2. However, before the movie ended, Brian and Tori got bored and wanted to go see a movie in the theaters. However, Cassie had no idea that both Brian and Tori were actually planning on committing a crime, one that would end her life. Unfortunately, we have the grueling task of killing our two friends, and they are right in that house just down the street. We just talked to them. We were there for an hour. But we checked out the whole house. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. Um, I unlocked the back doors. It's all locked. Now we just gotta wait. And um... prior to leaving, Brian and Tori had unlocked the basement door so they could sneak back in later. And when the two returned, they parked down the street and put on dark clothing, gloves, and masks. After they were ready, the two snuck back in through the basement while Cassie and Matt were watching TV. Brian and Tori then hid in the house and began to scare Cassie and Matt by making loud noises in the basement. However, soon they realized that it didn't work, and that's when they found the breaker and cut all power in the house. Cassie was frightened when the power went out, and Matt also noticed the dogs acting weird. One of the dogs kept staring, barking, and growling at the basement. Eventually, the power came back on, and Matt was spooked. He then immediately called his mom, asking if he could stay the night with Cassie because he was worried about her. But Matt's mom refused, and instead she offered Cassie to spend the night at their place. Cassie really wanted to go as she was terrified, but she knew she was here for her family and had to decline, stating that she needed to be there for the family pets. At around 10.30 p.m., Matt's mom picked him up and Cassie was alone. Matt then tried calling Brian and Tori to see if they could meet up later. When Brian and Tori answered, they were whispering. Matt thought it was a little bit weird, but at the same time, he knew they went to the movies and he didn't want to interrupt them if they were still watching a movie. Meanwhile, when Brian and Tori heard that Matt had left, they turned out the lights again, hoping that Cassie would start looking at what was causing the issue. But Cassie was terrified. She wanted to leave with Matt and get away from her family's home, However, she had to keep her promise and remained on the couch, scared in darkness, hoping to fall asleep. After time had passed, Brian and Tori were tired of waiting in the basement, 
and grabbed some knives so they could carry out their plan. Once the two made their way from the basement silently, they began slamming doors and making noises, continuing to scare Cassie. However, Cassie didn't respond and remained on the couch, terrified. When the two got tired, they gave up and went into the living room to find her. This is when Brian and Tori attacked Cassie, stabbing her about 30 times all over the body, including her chest, neck, back, and abdomen, with 12 being fatal. The following day, Matt met with Tori and tried getting a hold of Cassie, but she never answered. Cassie's body wasn't recovered until two days after the murder, when her aunt and uncle returned home from their trip. When they came home to Cassie's lifeless body, they were horrified and immediately contacted police. When the police arrived, they stated Cassie's body was covered in blood and was riddled with deep lacerations and stab wounds. Soon after police began the investigation, they questioned her boyfriend Matt, and he would explain the disturbing things that happened before he left that night, such as the power going out and the banging noises that came from the basement. This is when police also learned that Tori and Brian were also at the home prior to her death. The police then arrested Tori and Brian on September 27, 2006 on suspicion of murder and they were charged with first degree murder and conspiracy to commit first degree murder. Investigators then interrogated Tori and Brian that same day. We're going to make history. We're going to make history. For all you FBI agents watching this, <laughs> uh, you weren't quick enough. You weren't quick enough and you weren't s smart enough. He's a ghost He wasn't this accurate. He's a ghost Trust me. I don't know how. Two people in custody right now. You and Brian. That's been cleared today. Cleared by polygraph. Cleared by... All evidence. But we know what happened. What's that? We know exactly when Cassie died. Okay? I know exactly when. Okay? That first time. She died when you guys left. Right after you guys left and Matt left. Okay? Okay? So now you're telling me you just happened to be back in the neighborhood burglarizing cars with gloves on, but you don't go in to kill Cassie. Tori told detectives that Brian and him came over to Cassie's at 8.30 p.m. because they thought it was a house party. However, when they realized nothing was going to happen, the two left to go see a movie in theaters, and when the movie was over, they went back to Tori's and crashed at his place. However, the detectives weren't buying his alibi and probed Tori about the movie that he had reportedly seen that night. And Tori, lying through his teeth, said that he couldn't remember anything about it which drew even more suspicion. And shortly later, both Brian and Tori began stumbling all over their alibis and started blaming each other. We've got a lot of bargaining chips right now, but it's, it's, it just so requires, like Andy said, we, we possess some knowledge, first-hand knowledge. We know, and what we're really waiting for is you to come straight with us so that we can help get you out of this crap so it's not going to ruin the rest of your life. It's is the, this is the truth. It, you can, these things, we should be able to go out and confirm yes, and cooperate. Yes, this is, I was trying to hide this because I heard from a friend that, um, that that's uh, 10 years in prison. What exactly were you doing? Tell me exactly what you were doing. Did you guys dig anything up there? Uh, I mean, because you're probably gonna have dirt in the back of your car from a shovel from dirt that's gonna um, forensically match there up. There's dirt on that shovel already though. But I mean, we can match the dirt up, that's the good thing. What do you know about knives? We've been told you like knives. You play no. knives? Okay, I so. have three knives. Okay. Okay, do you have a knife on Friday? Yeah, no, I do. For sure? Yes. I'm sure nobody will saw you with a knife. Two guys in a mask messing around with a knife. But you like you like horror movies, you like scare movies and stuff like that. That's what I've been told about you. You dig you dig those kind of movies, right? Thriller movies, yeah. whatever you want to call them. You dig those kind of things. 
just go in there just to scare them, just to scare the crap out of them, and, you know, and be done with it. Because, you know, there's there's no other there's no other reason, you know. Mm-hmm. So tell us about that. Help us understand a little bit about. It. Yeah. You know exactly what happened, and you know what you need to do. So, unfortunately, you're not going anywhere tonight. You're going to be placed into custody tonight. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, that's the way it goes. You're going to be that's... charged with first degree murder. Okay. okay. But like I said before, before you say anything, I encourage you to talk to him. You should do that. I'm not, I'm not pulling punches here. <laughs> Still, your, your full cooperation can do nothing but help you at this point in time. I understand that, Tori. Okay. Yeah. Three days later, Brian eventually led law enforcement to the evidence that he buried in the Black Rock Canyon area. The evidence included two dagger-styled knives with sheets, a silver and black handled knife with a smooth blade, a folding knife, a red and white mask, latex gloves, and a damning videotape that contained footage of both the killers explicitly planning Cassie's murder. There should be no odd against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but yeah, hell, hell, you restrict somebody from it, they're gonna want it more. We found our victim, and sad as it may be, she's our friend. But you know what? We all have to make sacrifices. Our first victim is going to be Cassie's daughter. She's gonna be alone in a big, dark house out in the middle of nowhere. How perfect can you get? I, I mean, like, holy shit, dude. I'm horny just thinking about it. Hell yeah. I it was 9.50, September 22nd, 2006. We know there's lots of doors. There, there's lots of places to hide. I locked the back doors. That's all I locked. Now we just gotta wait. I just killed Cassie. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Dude, I oh just killed God. Cassie. Oh, oh, fuck. That felt like it wasn't real. Uh, I mean, it went by so Shut fast. the fuck up. We gotta get our act straight. Okay. During the trial, the prosecution revealed that Brian had said he was inspired by Eric Harris and Dylan Klibble who committed the Columbine High School Massacre. And Tori would state that he was inspired by the Scream film franchise. And eventually on August 21st, 2007, both Brian and Tori were found guilty of first degree murder. And each received life in prison without the possibility of parole and an additional 30 years to life on top of their life sentences. Today was the second day of Tori Adamchuk's post-conviction relief hearing, and today the convicted murderer took the stand himself. Magdala Lusant was in the courtroom and has more on the story. During day two of Adam Check's post-conviction relief hearing, the defense started their case on Wednesday, questioning the judge and past attorneys on whether the prosecution prohibited Adam Check's defense attorneys from having access to the actual murder weapons and if they offered Adam Check a plea deal of 30 years in prison. Then prosecuting attorneys Mark Heideman and Vic Pearson say if the defense attorneys wanted access to the murder weapons, they could have gotten them. And as far as the plea deal, they say an offer was made, but the defense never accepted it. Ron Rammel, the lead attorney for Adam Check eight years ago, says that's not true. The defense had to conduct their own test with replicas of the murder weapons, hiring Rudolph Ritt, a forensic investigator. Ultimately, doing this hurt the defense's case, leading Judge McDermott to throw out Ritt's findings and testimonies. But in Wednesday's hearing, new evidence was introduced, including the actual murder weapons and pictures of a pig with stab wounds from the actual knives. Ritt conducted this test to compare the stab markings to those on Cassie Joe Stoddard. And as far as a 30-year plea deal, Rammel says they were given a letter that said if both Brian Draper and Tori Adamchek pleaded guilty, then there would be a possibility to suggest a 30-year fixed sentence. But the informal discussions for his client about a plea deal were never made official. 
Taking the stand to address all those questions was Tori Adamchek. The now 25-year-old revisited the night of Cassie Jo Stoddard's murder, how it happened, and what led to Stoddard being stabbed 29 times, and how he and Draper buried the evidence. Adam Check says the plan was not to kill Cassie, but to scare her. He also says he never stabbed the victim, saying he felt anxious and shocked that night. Adam Check says going back to the 16-year-old he was then, if he was offered the 30-year plea deal, he would have taken it. Reporting in Pocatello, Magdala Lusant, KPBI News. Brian and Tori are still currently serving their sentences at Idaho State Correctional Institution. This is the tragic murder of Cassie Jo Stoddard. My heart goes out to the Stoddard family, but I'm relieved they were at least able to get closure. Brian and Tori were disturbing and morbid human beings inspired by a horrific massacre in history and deserve to rot in prison for the rest of their lives. What did you think about this video? Comment below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Also, if you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe for more disturbing content. This is Night Messenger. Thank you for watching, and I will see you all in the next video.